This is a presentation on respiratory physiology and anatomy that is a required topic by the American Dental Association for uh, nitrous oxide oxygen sedation courses. I'm presenting this uh, through my corporation, seconddentalopinion.com, which is uh, where I've uh, kept my teaching activities for the last 25 years. My name is Fred Kornstrom. I'm a dentist. I'm also a flight instructor. The truth were known, I'd probably rather be flying today, but the weather's not that great here in Seattle. Uh, the reason for placing this slide up here is so you have an email. FredQ at Comcast.net. You can reach me there if you have any questions. Uh, some people have asked if they can get continuing education credits for watching these presentations. This is uh, my fifth numbered presentation. There are two other presentations on YouTube that have to do with dentistry and uh, fear and pain control. Uh, this presentation is the same presentation that I've done many times for a variety of dental schools and continuing ed programs. But realize that it was recorded actually in June of 2016 and things change. Discoveries are made. Uh, the presentation might not be valid next month if somebody has some breakthrough research. Realistically, I don't think that's going to happen. It has morphed and been adjusted over the years as the topic expanded and there was more research done. But 70% uh, of it is the same material I was presenting even 25, 30 years ago. And remember when viewing this, I'm a general dentist and my emphasis on this is information that's needed by general dentists, although I do have a background in anesthesia. Uh, why would anyone want to watch a topic like this? It's pretty academic. Respiratory anatomy and physiology, that was sort of a nightmare that we sat through in dental school. And uh, the biggest reason is the American Dental Association requires that it be part of a nitrous oxide course or part of an oral conscious sedation course. And we all know that general dentists will try almost anything. And so the crew that uh, I've taught with for years decided, well, we'll give Fred uh, the heavy academic stuff. And so I got respiratory anatomy and physiology. And at some future date, I'll upload the lecture on uh, the anatomy of, of fear and pain in neurology, which is a real snoozer. It uh, actually can help you get to sleep if you watch it right before bedtime. So, what is the risk? Why are we concerned about respiratory anatomy and physiology? Well, this study of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, it was a close claim study of 624 cases, noted the most common cause of death and brain damage involved the respiratory system, the three most common problems were inadequate ventilation, esophageal intubation, and uh, difficult intubations in general. Uh, we don't intubate people, so the last two problems are not something we're going to find in dentistry, unless maybe you're doing general anesthesia and intubating people. However, when we start sedating people, uh, this is not so true with nitrous oxide, but more true with uh, oral or IV sedation, we can depress respiration and uh, this can decrease uh, the depth and the number of breaths a, a patient is taking and you can get into trouble. So let's take a look at all of this. Uh, first of all, respiratory regulation is active. Uh, inspiration at least is active. Uh, I'm talking so that means I'm modulating my breathing. Uh, so that I can create words and sentences. It's voluntary. I can hyperventilate. I doubt if you can hear that, but you can try in and out very quickly, and if you do it for very long, you get a bit dizzy because you blow off the levels of CO2 that your body is producing. We also breathe involuntarily, obviously. We don't stay awake all night thinking, breathe in, breathe out. Uh, this involuntary respiration is controlled by the levels of carbon dioxide in our bloodstream or in worst case scenario by low oxygen levels. There are also irritant receptors that can cause us to take a breath. Uh, sneezing uh, when you 
get a whiff of pepper would be such a reaction. There are other irritants that can cause you to sneeze. My wife cooked up some great shrimp one night, and she likes hot, spicy things. So she had the oil in the pan very hot, and she had, uh, I think it was Mongolian fire oil uh, in it to uh, flavor these shrimp. And when she put the shrimp into this mixture, there was a lot of uh, steam uh, coming out of the pan. It filled the kitchen, and we were all sneezing. So that takes care of inspiration. It's an active system. Expiration, when we breathe out, is for the most part passive. The elastic tissue of our lung tissues contract and it squeezes the air out. Now, if you get into heavy aerobics, your abdominal muscles and internal intercostal muscles can help squeeze the air out when you're doing heavy exertion. So some of it's active, but mostly it's passive due to the elasticity of the lung tissue. When we breathe, uh, we typically breathe in through our nasal cavities and then goes down to the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, the alveoli, the respiratory bronchioles, and when we refer to that term, the smaller bronchioles, there's actually some exchange of gas takes place between them and the capillaries, and finally the terminal alveoli. That's around the 20th to 27th uh, branch of this respiratory tree. What is the purpose of our nasal cavities? Well, a couple things. Uh, the nasal cavities hydrate the air that we breathe. So if you're in the Sahara Desert, as this camel is, and you breathe in, the air that gets to his lungs is 100% saturated with moisture, even though the air in the Sahara Desert is uh, very, very dry. It also cools the air so that the air getting to his uh, alveoli are body temperature. If you're up in Alaska, and it's my understanding here, I've never been where it was that cold, uh, you want to breathe through your nose because you don't want to breathe in through your mouth uh, when the air is 20 or 30 below. You could actually damage the, the lung tissue. So by breathing through your nose, in that case, the air is warmed. And... Uh, that's part of why the camel has such a big nose, is because he has to have a lot of surface area. Now, when the camel exhales, this same tissue in his nose absorbs the moisture and gives uh, back the heat so that the air coming out of his nostrils is very nearly as dry as it was coming in, and it's about the same temperature of the de desert. And a third factor, I've been told, the, the lady camels like uh, the male camel, uh, facial expression. So let's take a look at these breathing tubes. Uh, here we have the larynx coming down into the trachea, right and left main stem bronchus, and they continue to branch and branch and branch. The larger uh, alveoli, I'm sorry, the larger trachea bronchi, uh, have a cartilaginous ring that keeps them open. This becomes important when we talk about asthma patients because as you get smaller and smaller, you lose the cartilaginous ring and there is some muscle tissues around these uh, bronchioles which can constrict in the case of the asthma patient. And here we see the trachea, the main bronchioles down here, Finally, to the respiratory bronchioles, things are getting quite small here, and in this area, gaseous exchange takes place from here on down to the point where we get into the alveoli, where most of the gas exchange. So from here down to these respiratory bronchioles, it's uh, typically tubes that are conducting air. When we get down near the terminal area, here we have gaseous ex exchange between the air in the alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles and uh, the red blood cells and plasma in the capillaries. Here we have a set of lungs. You see the trachea right and left main stem bronchus and they branch and branch and branch and get smaller and smaller and smaller. The lungs are made up of various lobes, which are sort of functional divisions. 
Uh, here we see the bronchioles. We're now into the respiratory bronchioles that are opening into the small alveolar sacs. The more alveolar sacs we have, the greater surface area we have to exchange gases. So it's important that they be very small as opposed to just two large bags that you would see if we just had one alveoli on one side and one on the other. The surface area of the adult lung, if we could peel out these alveoli, open them up and, and plant them on a surface, is about equivalent to the surface area of a tennis court. So there's lots of surface in the area for the gases to diffuse across. When we get down to the alveoli, we also have some smooth muscle tissue, which I spoke a little bit about. And we have some connective tissue. And we have many, many, many little capillaries uh, that are very closely associated with the alveoli carrying blood that's there to be oxygenated and to get rid of uh, the carbon dioxide. And here you see the elastic fibers. So when we relax after inhaling, these elastic fibers uh, shrink the alveoli back down to normal size, and that's how we exhale. Inside the alveoli, we have uh, a couple of uh, epithelial surfaces, the alveoli surface and the capillary surface. And so there's very, very little distance here that the oxygen has to diffuse to get into the plasma and into the red blood cells. And conversely, the carbon dioxide diffuses out into the alveoli so that it can be exhaled, exhaled when we breathe out. So what is the function of breathing? Well, obviously, it's gas exchange. We inhale uh, air, and the body uses the oxygen for energy, and we exhale uh, carbon dioxide. It's also used for acid-base uh, regulation, we'll talk quite a bit about. And there are some other mechanisms involved, filtration. The hair in our nose tends to keep out small spiders and marmots. We've talked about humidification and warming. Uh, there's a mucociliary escalator that brings up uh, the larger particles, around two microns. Uh, and in the morning, we get up, blow our nose. And if you're a guy, you peel back the Kleenex to see what sort of critters crawled up your nose last night. Ladies tend to just throw it in the garbage. And then for particles smaller than two microns that the mucociliary escalator doesn't work for, we have white cells that phagocytize these. I think I just made up a word there. The other thing that the lung tissue does is produce surfactant, and we'll talk about surfactant. So here we go. We eat some food. Uh, it's digested. The food particles, basically carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, get into our bloodstream. It goes to the muscles where oxygen is added. That creates energy, which allows our muscles to do things. It allows our brain uh, to function. All, all our bodily functions require some energy, and this is where they get it. And in turn, uh, they give off carbon dioxide and some water. Now, you add carbon dioxide to water, and you get carbonic acid, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But here we see carbon dioxide. Here's a capillary. The carbon dioxide diffuses out of the capillary into the alveoli. The alveoli is connected to bronchioles, and when we exhale, the carbon dioxide is excreted. The oxygen has come down those same breathing tubes into the alveoli, and, and actually this green arrow should have come here, and it then diffuses into the capillaries that are close by. And that's how we get oxygen into our tissues and how we get rid of our carbon dioxide. I did talk a bit about acid-base regulation. Our carbon dioxide plus water creates carbonic acid, which disassociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. The pH of the blood, and this will bring back nightmares unless you really love math, is the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration, meaning the more hydrogen ion have, the smaller number your pH is. And uh, we'll see that it's around 7.3, 7.4. Uh, and that actually can be calculated by the Henderson-Hesselbach equation. This bring back, brings back nightmares of 
organic chemistry, but uh, pH equals the pK plus the log of carbonic acid divided by uh, the concentration of CO2, and it, it equals about 1.3. The value of the pKa is 6.1. The normal hydrogen or carbonic acid concentration in arterial blood is about 24. Uh, I think that's micromoles per liter. Thus, the normal pH is 7.4 between 6.1 added to 1.3. We have a weak acid and its salt, carbonic acid and carbonate ions, which is then a buffer system. And uh, if you go through all the calculations here, what if we doubled the CO2 concentration rather than 1.3? We'd have 2.6. We go through the mathematics, and suddenly the pH is 7.1. The blood is more acidic, and it's these extra hydrogen ions that, that uh, stimulate us to take a breath. So let's take a look at some of these other mechanisms before we get into the heavy math. Uh, we talked about filtration, humidification, and warming, gross debridement. Uh, filtration... Uh, the nasal hair is, filters out the big things, but not the smaller ones. And uh, here we see a patient who had a rubber dam clamp being placed on a molar. They were going to do endo. It popped off, and unfortunately, he inhaled it, and it ended down in his trachea. That's exactly what we don't want to have happen. But it's one of the things and one of the hazards of working in the math, and we have to be very careful that such things don't get down uh, into the trachea. We don't want them to swallow them either, but if they got to do one or the other, it's probably better to swallow. Smaller items, uh, we have a mucosally escalator. If you look very carefully, you can see these little fibrils on the epithelium lining uh, the bronchi and the trachea. They will bring up small particles. They beat and they bring it on up and, and eventually we deposit it in a Kleenex in the morning. The smokers, on the other hand, have many more particles and they lose this uh, microciliary escalator so they no longer have that. This gross debridement works down to about two microns in size. Here we have alveoli that are very disrupted. They're not the nice little round circles we saw. And we see a lot of black stuff here. This black stuff is carbon. This probably was the lung of a smoker. And these are the particles smaller than 2 micron that the mucociliary escalator doesn't help with. And in the case of the smoker, they don't have the mucociliary escalator anyway. So they be, end up being gobbled up by the white blood cells. Let's take a look at the major muscles involved. Diaphragm, we know, is a large dome-shaped muscle, and I'll see a bit of an image here in a minute, used for inspiration. When the muscle contracts, the dome comes down, creating a larger chest cavity, and uh, we can't create a vacuum, so our mouth is open, our nose is open, and we bring air down into the lungs. The external intercostal muscles work by raising the chest cavity some. It would have been a lot nicer if the external intercostals were uh, inside the internal intercostals, and then it would the ex internals would be for inspiration, the externals would be for, I'm sorry, the internals would be for inspiration, the externals would be for expiration. But it didn't happen that way. And this was one of the challenges in anatomy in dental school, was to realize that it was the external, the outer layer of muscles, that when they contracted, we tended to inhale. And the internal ones, when they contracted, it tended to push uh, the ribs down, and that would help us exhale. There are also accessory muscles. Uh, they're all inspiratory uh, abdominal wall muscles, the scalenes, and the pectorals. I'm sorry, I just said that back. They're all for expiration. Squeeze our abdomen, it tends to squeeze the air out of our lungs. Same with the scalenes and the pectoral muscles. So here we see the internal and external intercostals. The externals here uh, 
when they contract, it brings the rib cage up, making the chest cavity expand. When the internal intercostals, which are inside the externals, contract, it does the opposite. It tends to bring the uh, chest uh, rib cage down. Let's talk a bit about volumes, and one of the most important items we'll talk about is tidal volume, which is the volume of each breath times the rate. And in the typical human uh, adult, that is between 5 and 6 liters per minute. So tidal volume, which is what you're probably going on right now, you've been listening to me for 10, 15 minutes, uh, you're getting a little sleepy, it's about 500 cc's per breath, and if we breathe 12 times a minute, that gives us our 6 liters per minute, which is our minute volume. Now, we have the ability to inhale very deeply, and uh, in athletes, they can bring in an additional 3 liters per minute, increasing the vital capacity from 500, to, uh, from 500 cc's to 4.8 liters. It's a major increase. If we forcefully exhale, we can blow out about a liter of air, which can bring that capacity now up to 5.8 liters per minute, which you would be using in heavy aerobics. But in fact, what most of us are doing, uh, sitting around doing nothing very athletic or when we're in the dental chair, is this minute volume of about 6 liters per minute. Once you, once you were born and took your first breath, your lungs had a residual volume of one to two liters, and there's just no way to get all of the air out of your lungs. So we beat this one to death, but the minute volume is the volume of the breath times the number of breaths per minute. If we breathe 10 to 12 times per minute, uh, and we breathe about 500 cc's, that gives us, and here's a mistake, oh, 500 cc's equals half a liter. So 10 to 12 times half a liter is 5 to 6 liters per minute is a normal minute volume. Why is that important? Well, with your nitrous machine, you should never be giving less than 5 liters per minute total gas flow to be sure that the patient isn't rebreathing. Uh, any of their own exhaled air. Now, with the one-way valves that are on current machines, that won't happen, but what will happen is they will empty the reservoir bag, and when that happens, there's a pop-off valve that allows room air into the system because you don't want them trying to suck on an empty reservoir bag. It can be very frightening to the fearful patient. And fortunately for us, all the machines read in liters per minute, even though here in America we don't do many things with the metric system, this is one that we do. So when we look at the minute volume, gee, that's a lot of gas. That's really great. But not all gas has a chance. There's a dead zone. This is the area in the trachea, the nose, the oral pharynx, down to the respiratory bronchioles, where there's no exchange of gas takes place. So you inhale, you bring air into that area, you exhale that same air unused. It didn't have the oxygen removed. It's about 150 cc's, or about 30% of that 500 cc breath. There's shunting where uh, normally most of the alveoli get good blood flow. With shunting, which is worse in some disease states, those alveoli uh, either have larger vessels that shunt the blood past before it can be absorbed, or they have scarring around the alveoli so the uh, capillaries are unable to unload their load of oxygen. This is a chart that we all saw in dental school, and scared us half to death, but what we're seeing here, this is dry air, and remember oxygen is 21% of dry air, nitrogen is about 79 percent. The total pressure on a normal day is 760 millimeters of mercury, also known as TOR. So if we multiply 760 by 21, it will come out at about 159 
millimeters of mercury. That's the pressure of oxygen in the air. There's a little bit of carbon dioxide, but it's very small. We can pretty much ignore it here. And nitrogen is a partial pressure of about 600 torr. When we get into the trachea, some things have started to happen. First of all, we humidified that air when we brought it in through our nose. And so there's a pressure of about 47 millimeters of mercury of water vapor. And so the total vapor pressure of oxygen now is 149, water vapor 47, nitrogen 563. The total has to continue to be atmospheric pressure. When we get down to the alveoli, it appears that we've lost some of the oxygen. It went from 149 to 104. Well, in the alveoli, we're going to have some carbon dioxide that's been uh, given off by the capillaries. Uh, the nitrogen has remained essentially unchanged, but here is where we're giving up the oxygen. So this is uh, diffusion factor, there's 104 millimeters of mercury of oxygen pressure in the alveoli, in the arterial blood about 100. So this is higher pressure, it diffuses into the alveoli. Uh, at this point, we'll ignore the other gases. Uh, when we get to the venous blood, this is the blood coming back to the lungs. Uh, the oxygen tension is about 40 millimeters of mercury. So what's really happening here, alveoli, uh, alveolar oxygen, 104, is diffusing into that venous blood, bringing that up to 100 when uh, now it's known as uh, arterial blood. In turn, the venous blood has about 46 millimeters of mercury uh, pressure of carbon dioxide, and it's diffusing into the alveolar air, and when we exhale, we blow that out into the room. So this is a diffusion process. We bring the air down, it diffuses across membranes to get into the bloodstream, into the plasma of the bloodstream, and these concentrations suddenly start to make a little bit of sense. And here, dramatic, er, dramatically, diagrammatically, our uh, venous blood comes into the left side of the heart, it travels to the lungs where it's oxygenated, I'm sorry, and it then comes into the left side of the heart and is pumped out of the left side of the heart out to the tissues of the body where carbon dioxide is added and that comes back now to the right side of the heart and that pumps up to the lungs. And in this way, we get the oxygen out of the air down to the bodies that need that for energy, and they in turn give off carbon dioxide, which comes back to the lungs and is exhaled into the air. This can be a much, much more complex discussion, but it's not necessary for what we're doing. When the oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream, we have red blood cells and the bulk of the oxygen is carried in the red blood cells. A much smaller part is um, dissolved in the plasma. Uh, the carbon dioxide is carried somewhat on the hemoglobin, uh, but a greater extent from the plasma, dissolved in the plasma. And it's these dissolved gases that give us the pressures we were talking about uh, several slides ago. The respiratory center, how do we breathe? Well, it's located in the ventral portion of our medulla in the midbrain. It's stimulated by carbon dioxide levels and by low oxygen levels and by irritant receptors. Uh, the respiratory center can be depressed largely by opioids, the mu agonists, uh, coating to a lesser extent, morphine, Demerol, uh, all the narcotics. The benzodiazepines do this to a much smaller level, if at all. That's good news. And what does the respiratory center do? It stimulates the inspiratory area. What does the inspiratory area do? 
Uh, it's the area that's stimulated by carbon dioxide. There are receptors at the bifurcation of the carotid and aortic bodies that are sensitive to oxygen, and they send signals up to stimulate the inspiratory area. Uh, it's depressed by the stretch receptors of the lung and chest wall, and its purpose is to stimulate the inspiratory musculature. Now, that probably has you a little bit confused. But we'll get to a diagram here in a minute. It'll make sense. So here we have the expiratory center in the midbrain. And in that is the inspiratory area. And it'll send signals down to the diaphragm. And I'm not the greatest artist, but you'll see that. We have voluntary control, as we've talked about, which allow us to breathe, or we can hyperventilate, or we can hold our breath if we want. And that stimulates the inspiratory area that sends a signal down to the diaphragm. The diaphragm then contracts, and when it contracts, the chest cavity enlarges, so that drags air into the lungs. When the lungs are as full as they can be, the stretch receptors that we talked about send an inhibitory signal up here to the inspiratory center saying, stop, stop, stop. And so that signal is blocked, and that allows the diaphragm to relax. The elastic tissues in the lungs squeeze them to close, bringing the abdominal or the, the diaphragmatic muscle up, and it's all primed to take another breath. We beat this one to death, but the importance of it is the hydrogen ion concentration is a major stimulus to breathing. So over here, we have carbon dioxide plus water becomes carbonic acid, becomes uh, bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. And the hydrogen ions stimulate the inspiratory area to cause us to take a breath. The aortic bodies are located in the bifurcation of the subclavian common carotid arteries and the bifurcation of the internal external carotid arteries. And they're sensitive to low levels of oxygen, below 60 tor, or 60 millimeters of mercury. Now, that's pretty low. My wife grew up in uh, South America. Uh, her father was with the diplomatic corps. Her teenage years were spent in Bolivia. We visit Bolivia every so often because she's still got really good friends down there. And when you get off the plane at the El Alto airport, you're at 13,500 feet. And even at that altitude, you still have more than 60 tor of oxygen. Uh, if I remember right, the total atmospheric pressure there is about 60% of what it is at sea level. So if it's sea level, the atmospheric oxygen is 150 tor. 60% of that would still be roughly 100 tor. And so this oxygen drive only kicks in if you're at a very high altitude probably around 18,000 feet, or if you've got a really lousy set of lungs that's not getting a lot of oxygen to your red blood cells. The bad news is this area is depressed by the nitrous oxide, and that's one of the reasons we don't use nitrous oxide on COPD patients, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients. So the aortic body stimulates the respiratory center, but it depends on having very, very low levels of oxygen. So here's where these sensors are, and they send stimulant signals up to the inspiratory area, causing the patient to breathe. But remember, it only kicks in at very low oxygen concentrations, and uh, you got to be either have a very lousy set of lungs or be at very high altitude for that to kick in. So let's take a look at some of this. Carbon dioxide is our primary stimulus to breathing. You see the percentage of nitrous oxide down here, and it continually increases the respiratory minute volume up until about 10% carbon dioxide. And from that point on, it, it depresses the respiratory system. When we were in dental school, we had a respirometer, and we put various concentrations of CO2 in it and then had various classmates breathe. I was the one that got the 10% mixture of carbon dioxide. This uh, canister that was part of the respirometer was about the size of a small garbage can. 
I emptied it in under a minute. I've never breathed so hard or so fast or been so uncomfortable in my life. It is a phenomenal respiratory stimulant up to 10%. Beyond 10%, it can depress respiration, eventually leading to death. But in fact, it was the first general anesthetic. They put a cat to sleep with high levels of CO2. Now, pH, I've said, is our primary stimulus to breathing. And we seem to like to be about 7.3. As our blood becomes more acidic, we see a great burst here in stimulus to breathe around 7, 7.1. As we get down in this area, it that uh, decreases, and that probably has to do uh, with exactly what we're seeing up here uh, with the CO2. Up to this level of pH, it's a stimulant, and then it drops off. But let's look at low oxygen levels. Here we are at 18%, 16%, 14%, 12%. 12% is uh, probably about where we were in uh, Bolivia at the airport. We really hadn't changed much. We did one day go to 16,000 feet, and we might have been breathing a little bit more there. But you've got to get much further down the road here, down to between 4 and 6% oxygen for that to be much of a stimulus. Now, how can we screw all this up? Well, here we see a sort of normal curve, the response to various levels of carbon dioxide. 37, 38 is sort of normal. Uh, we live in this range here. And as if we hold our breath and, and run our pH down or raise our CO2 levels, we really start to stimulate breathing. But all we have to do is give a narcotic, meperidine being one that has a very potent respiratory depressant. And notice here, to get the same amount of air moved, the CO2 levels have to be much higher. It went from 38 to 42, and it's still less. We get out here, and uh, we really should be breathing here at about 8 liters per minute. And in fact, we're just breathing normally because of the narcotics. So you have to be very careful with the narcotics. They can be potent respiratory depressants. Elastic fibers uh, in the uh, trachea and bronchioles, I've talked a bit about. Uh, this is the problem with the asthmatics. These elastic fibers and smooth muscle contract. The patient breathes in pretty well, but they have a very difficult time breathing out. And here's something like this. That wheezing is the patient trying to get air out through these constricted uh, bronchioles. Uh, up until the time we get to the bronchioles, we have cartilage, which tends to hold these breathing uh, tubes open. But you notice here when we get to the bronchioles, we got the fiber, but we don't have any cartilage, so it collapses. So they breathe in pretty well, but they have a hard time breathing out. We once went to a uh, meteor shower in Australia. The fellow who came along was uh, a writer for Parade Magazine, wrote a lot of scientific and astrophysics articles, and was a pretty severe asthmatic. And he'd get up to lecture and he'd be wheezing, and out of his pocket would come his little inhaler and he'd take a couple of puffs, and within a few seconds he was breathing normally. But that's the way he lived. He needed his inhaler on a regular basis to relax these elastic fibers. Then we finally get down to the alveoli. The smaller the better, and this is where we see the damage of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. COPD comes in two varieties. Uh, two main causes, chronic bronchitis, and some of the emphysematics go on to COPD, uh, and emphysema, uh, which is largely a disease of smokers, coal miners, people who have uh, breathed in a lot of bad stuff. And what happens, uh, particularly with the smokers, and it happens to a certain extent genetically, they don't build as much uh, of the chemical that keeps their alveoli small surfactant, which is a body-produced basic type of detergent 
these people come in, in two varieties. The pink puffers, which always reminds me of a banker that lived or worked about a block from my office. A uh, thin guy, not very tall, maybe 5'3", uh, uh, quite thin. He came in, he had a, a few lower teeth left, and he wanted to denture. The teeth were breaking down and were giving him a lot of trouble. And I said, you know, it might make sense to uh, do a couple of root canals. This is 40 years ago, before we knew about implants. And do an overdenture by keeping those root tips uh, we can help preserve your bone level and it will give that denture much more bone to rest on and be used for retention in 20 years than what uh, you'll have if we take them all out. And he looks at me and he says, hey, who are we fooling, Doc? He says, you read my medical history. I've got COPD. I'm not going to be around in 20 years. It's a terminal disease and I'm getting pretty far down the slide. I just want something that I can eat my food and enjoy eating for the rest of my life. And he was, he basically was right on. He knew his disease and the level of his disease much better than I. Uh, when we took the teeth out, his blood really wasn't very red. It was more of a brown color. So he was not oxygenating well. But he's thin, he's small, he uh, moves controlled. You don't find him out jogging. He walks at a steady pace. He gets along pretty well in life. Uh, because he doesn't have to exert himself a lot. Uh, he couldn't run a marathon uh, many times just walking from the reception room back to the treating area. These people will be out of breath, so they're, they're not hard to identify. And, and it's only those in the very end stages that we have to worry a lot about. The blue bloaters, on the other hand, is a COPD patient who is also uh, very heavy and he's into congestive heart failure because of his crappy lungs and his weight. And these are the folks that sit down in your chair and their nail beds are blue, their lips are blue, they're having a hard time breathing, uh, and you got to be really careful of them because of their bad heart. Uh, their life expectancy is very limited and you don't want it to end in your office. And for that reason, uh, neither of these people are good candidates for nitrous oxide because they're living on the oxygen drive. And if you suddenly give them a lot of oxygen, you're going to knock out that drive and they're going to stop breathing. That was a case I learned about, that's probably 35 years ago. A fellow was brought into the VA hospital in Portland. Very cyanotic, blue lips, blue fingers, huffing and puffing. He's having a hard time breathing. And it was July 2nd or July 3rd, which is a very dangerous time to visit a hospital. And the reason for that is on the 1st of July, the medical students become interns, the interns become residents, and you get a new batch of medical students. So there's a changeover in who's charge in charge. And in fact, it's probably the nurses that are in charge, but these young physicians have a hard time accepting that sometimes. And so in this case, a fellow came into the emergency department. He was very cyanotic. The young intern said, ah, he needs some oxygen. So he put him on an oxygen mask and the guy stopped breathing. They had to intubate him and put him on a respirator. And they had to very carefully wean him off the respirator over a number of days to get him back to that very brutal area he calls life. Uh, in that case, the oxygen was too much. Well, you think, well, if he stops breathing, it'll use up the oxygen, he'll start breathing again. The problem is that when he does that, stop breathing, the carbon dioxide levels just skyrocket, which cause other cardiac problems. So because of the lactosurfactant, the word that I was having trouble with a minute ago, because of disease or smoking, Many of the small alveoli expand and become fewer. And the larger alveoli that form have less surface area to exchange gas. And that's why this patient is not able to get rid of his CO2. And he has a hard time bringing oxygen into his lungs. He can bring it into the lungs, but the surface area allowing it to diffuse into the bloodstream is less. Because of this, the CO2 levels tend to climb, the O2 levels tend to fall, and in time, these patients can 
compensate. We'll talk about that in a minute. So here's a normal set of lungs, nice small alveoli, a negative pleural pressure so that when the chest cavity enlarges, that negative pressure pulls gas into the alveoli. And when they exhale, you still have a negative pressure in the pleural space and the gas is able to leave. With the diseased lung, we have bigger alveoli, we have lots of garbage, mucus plugs, polyps, thickened mucosa, uh, oftentimes bronchiospasms. So there's a much uh, increased negative pleural pressure to inhale, but then when it comes time to exhale, they actually have to squeeze their chest to try to force the air out, and that shuts some of these areas where the uh, gas should be leaving. And you oftentimes will see that person purse their lips so that they can blow against pressure when they exhale. And in that way, they can overcome some of this negative pressure by having a slight positive pressure in their breathing tubes. On a more histologic picture, normal, long, lots of very small microscopic alveoli, good open airways, and the negative pleural space in the diseased lung. Now, if it was this large an alveoli, that would probably be a surgical emergency, and they'd remove that lobe of the lung, because if that ruptures into the pleural space, you then have a pneumothorax, and you lose the negative pressure and you're unable to move gas out of that lung. You also see alveoli down here with a lot of scarring. And the really important thing is when they try to exhale, they end up with a positive pleural pressure, which tends to shut off these little passageways that the air has to take. We saw this histologically. These are the nice small alveoli. And over here we have the disrupted alveoli of the COPD patient and from the carbon specs, probably a former smoker. In the most severe form, these patients may run on an oxygen drive. So we have beat this formula to death, but carbon dioxide eventually creates hydrogen ions, which stimulate breathing. But in the COPD patient, their kidneys retain bicarbonate ions, and that tends to shift this equation back to the left so that they don't get the low pH because the hydrogen ions is shifted back into the carbonic acid form. And thus, the high CO2 levels here are not changing the pH of the blood. And it's a good thing that they aren't because if you stimulated these people to this extent, they'd be panting like a puppy dog and uh, they would breathe themselves to death. They'd be totally exhausted by this effort. Even though they weren't moving a lot of air, they would be breathing very rapidly. Back to this. Here are those carotid and aortic bodies that stimulate this, and it's stimulated due to this very low oxygen pressure uh, in the bloodstream. If it weren't for this, these patients wouldn't survive. But they, we have to watch them very carefully because these carotid bodies, they are sensitive to low O2 levels, a little bit sensitive to pH. Uh, it goes by the glossopharyngeal nerve. I'm sure you all know which nerve that is. We had to learn it at one time. The aortic bodies are less sensitive to pH, and that goes by the vagus nerve. And here you see those nerves going from the bifurcation of these major vessels to the midbrain with the signals to breathe. So how do you monitor all this? Well, in the bad old days, if the patient was pink, everything was good. If they were getting a little cyanotic, then you need to give them some more oxygen. And if they take on this uh, gray death look, well, then it's time, they're severe cyanotic, uh, to start assisting their respiration. Time to wake up the anesthesiologist at the head of the table and have him be breathing for the patient. It, today we have much better ways of monitoring and it's with our pulse oximeter. Here is an area that uh, lets off a purple light which passes through the finger. The finger is this area in here. 
that has some blood. Uh, the red blood cycle, uh, the red blood cells that are depleted of oxygen tend to absorb the purple light because they are more purple in color. And then there's a sensor down here to see how much light was lost. And uh, similarly, we have an area of a sensor that's sensitive to red light, which is the other light that shows. And the oxygenated blood vessels are reddish, and they absorb the red light. This is carried to the monitor through the magic of integrated circuits. We get a digital readout. What percentage of the oxygen, uh, uh, what percentage of the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen? And this shows 98%. That should always be above 90. Here's the oxyhemoglobin concentration curve that we all met as dental students. We always want to be above 90% saturated. I had a, a patient for a long, long time, a Down syndrome child who was actually 35. He was kind of a fun guy. Uh, pretty severely retarded, but he was a good little artist. He'd always come in and draw me a picture of a horse. And he came in one day and he he looked bad. His lips were blue. His fingernail beds were blue. And I said, David, what's going on? Oh, he says, I got a cold. I don't feel very good. I looked at him. I said, you don't look very good either. I don't think we're going to do anything to you today. But here, I want to slip this sensor on your finger and, and see uh, what's going on. And so the pulse oximeter is down here reading about 55%. That concerned me enough. I called his physician and said, you know, I've got David here. His oxygen saturation is uh, down about 55%. He was curious. He said, how do you know that? And I said, well, I have a pulse oximeter. Mile. Oh, he says, that's good. I don't have one. And I said, well, I don't know. Should I send him to the emergency room? He says, no, no, David doesn't like to go to the hospital. Uh, he's got the flu. I saw him the other day, and He's got a cruddy set of lungs, and he's got some transpositioning of major vessels going to and from his heart. And uh, they're not going to be able to do anything for him, uh, but I wouldn't treat him. Well, I'd already made that decision. So David is back about two weeks later. He drew me a picture of a horse this time. He's his normal happy self. Now, How are you doing, David? Oh, he says, I feel much better. So I said, here, let's put your finger in this thing and see where you are normally. Normally for David was about... 70% uh, saturation. He could not get above 75% saturation, even if we had him hyperventilate. So this was due to uh, the transposition of the various vessels. But we want our patients to be above 90% saturated. So you know me, I like to do little studies. So we decided to take our kids and their spouses down to Bolivia to see where my wife grew up. And so I got my little finger pulse oximeter and sitting at the airport at SeaTac here in Seattle, uh, I think it's about 600 foot altitude, our average was 98% saturation. In the aircraft, I asked the stewardess what the atmospheric pressure was, it, it's the pressurized aircraft, of course, and she went and asked the pilot and he said it, it was about uh, 5,000 feet. And on the airplane, I again, uh, with, there were eight of us in the group, uh, kept track of the concentrations, and our average was about 95, 96% saturation with some, some variation. Uh, we got to our friends in Bolivia, and they lived down from the airport, uh, 3,000 feet, uh, at about 10, almost 11,000 feet. Our average saturation was about 89%, and now we're getting some big variations. Uh, so we're below what I would consider an emergency here in Seattle. At the airport, the El Alto Airport in La Paz, Bolivia, is at 13,029 feet. We were down about 86%, and... Uh, my wife, who's on beta blockers, so her heart doesn't speed up much, was down here about 78%. Uh, they took us out for a picnic at a lake that was almost 16,000 feet. Beautiful setting. But our averages here, particularly after we'd been there for a while, was down about 79%. My poor wife was down here at about 75% saturation. Interestingly enough, the Bolivians saturation was the same. 
but they were out playing soccer, and I had a hard time getting from the car to the picnic table. Very, very uncomfortable. You just took big, deep breaths trying to get some, some oxygen to your muscles. Well, how were the Bolivians able to play soccer? Well, when you live at that altitude, your body produces more red blood cells. So the red blood cells aren't any, the hemoglobin molecules are not any more saturated, but they've got many more blood cells. So it's kind of like if you've got big buckets, uh, you can put the fire out quickly. The Bolivians, their buckets are only half full like ours, but they got many more buckets. And so they could play soccer at that altitude, even though we were being pretty uh, lucky to just be able to sit there and watch. And uh, here's my GPS unit showing that at, when I took this reading, it was 14,617. And my oxygen saturation, this must have been my wife, was 63. I'm sorry, it was 86. This probably was me with a 63 pulse rate. So altitude, uh, sort of, it, it's a, a physiology uh, lesson if you bring along your pulse oximeter and your GPS. Uh, modern pulse oximeters in the office, particularly if you're going to be doing oral conscious sedation, should be like the ones you see here. They have alarms that go off and tell you uh, if you've dropped below 90%, or you can set them at 92%. Uh, interestingly enough, I found a little pulse oximeter for my iPhone. It uses the light from your flash on your iPhone. You put your finger over that and you push the start button here and after a couple of minutes it tells you what your heart rate is and what your uh, hemoglobin saturation is. It's not real accurate, but plus or minus a couple percent. But it's always on your phone. So for three bucks or four bucks, I think it was a pretty good purchase. And we're going to now talk a little bit about end tidal CO2. We've talked about we're producing CO2. And uh, can we measure that? Well, we can. The machine is pretty pricey. I think they're now down to about three or $4,000. You put a nasal cannula on the person. And if I can get this video to play... It doesn't appear that it wants to play while we're recording, but you see something like this on the end tidal CO2 monitor. You, it measures the concentration of CO2. And here's the very last bit of your exhaled air, which is the end tidal point. Then you rest and inhale, and so there's no CO2 to speak of. And then here you start your exhalation again. And it measures that peak, and it displays that digitally. It was 37 millimeters of mercury. I, I then had uh, Debbie, who you saw in the previous picture, hyperventilate. And so here she is with these little short breaths, but she's going really fast as compared to what she was doing here. And she blew off her CO2 and she got down to 17 torr. So this is required if you're going to do IV sedation, if you're going to do general anesthesia. It's not required for nitrous oxide. It really wouldn't tell us much if it did. The biggest reason for using it in anesthesia and IV sedation, if the patient should stop breathing or if they should be breathing weirdly and the CO2 levels fall, the alarms go off very quickly, whereas with the pulse oximeter uh, on the video that we couldn't get to run, a pulse oximeter, Debbie could hold her breath for a minute, and at the end of a minute, her oxygen saturation in the pulse oximeter was about 96%, still very good, but she hadn't been breathing for a whole minute. The trend was down, and the point of that whole discussion is uh, if they're not breathing well and you start to see the pulse oximeter fall, even though they're above 90%, get concerned as to why it's dropping. The end tidal CO2 will warn you much earlier that there's an issue. Uh, we may in the future be seeing some demand flow devices. This is something that's used in aviation. It's a tiny little uh, unit, a uh, little bigger than a king size pack of cigarettes that will give the patient as much gas as they need as quickly as they need it uh, via cannula. So you can have a cannula like this, giving them nitrous oxide oxygen, and when they inhale, the uh, diaphragm in here opens quickly and gives them as much gas as they want, and then it shuts off once they're done inhaling so that you don't keep blowing it into the air.
here's the inside of the unit, and you see a couple of the diaphragms that are involved in that uh, rapid turning on and turning off. Well, that's the end of what I have to talk about today. Probably way more than you wanted to know. It certainly wasn't my favorite subject in dental school. But it is required by the American Dental Association if you're going to use nitrous oxide and oxygen as a sedation or if you want to do oral conscious sedation. So we have to fight our way through it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, many states will accept this lecture uh, for your yearly requirements of CE. Some states, Oregon being one of them, require that you take a quiz or a test, heaven forbid that ugly word, and uh, then you have to submit a document that you completed it and that you passed a quiz. So if you're in a state that needs a quiz, uh, email me at fredq at comcast.net and I will send you the quiz. I'll email it to you and fill out the quiz and send it to me in a self-addressed stamped envelope so I know exactly where to send the certifying letter. I will grade the quiz and send you back uh, the graded quiz along with a letter certifying that you indeed listened and were able to pass the test. And if you ever just have any questions, fredq at comcast.net is my email. It's uh, easy to get a hold of me. And with that, I'd like to thank you all.